Now, what I'm about to propose, I've never heard anybody talk about before. What I'm about to suggest, I've never read or had anybody read, write this. And so you can take it for what it's worth. But this past week, as I was digging into this passage of scripture, the Holy Spirit nudged me. I just kept thinking, there's something here that I'm not getting. There's something here that I'm not getting. There's something here for like three days. There's something here that I'm not getting. And what I'm about to tell you, it's going to be a Mike Decker perspective. And you can take it or leave it, but I think I'm spot on. I believe this to be true. Do y'all remember the story in the Bible called the Battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6? In the Old Testament portion of the Bible, there's a story where God tells Moses, this, this, this Israelite Jew, this, this, to go into Egypt to deliver the Israelites, the nation of Israel, from slavery and then lead them to a place that God had promised them, a land where they would live known as the Promised Land. Well, in Joshua chapter 6, we're told about a story where as the Israelites are just kind of getting their stuff together, they encounter their, their sort of their first battle uh, assignment where they come upon this, this town called Jericho that's surrounded by white walls. You remember that story? Read it if, if, you're, if it's not familiar to you. And in God's instruction to sort of demonstrate to his people that he is king and he is large and in charge, he said, here's all I want you to do. For seven days, I want you to walk around the city walls. The people are to be quiet. They're not to raise their voice. They're not to say anything. So day one, just simply walk around the, the, the city walls and have the, 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 the priests blow their ram's horn. Are you with me? So day one, the people march. The people anticipate. And then they return to camp and they wait on God. They too, the people walk in silence. They anticipate. Then they go back to camp and they wait on God. Day three, day four, day five, day six, the people walk once around the city. They march. They anticipate God's going to do something. Then they go back to camp and they wait on God. But then day seven comes. You know what happens on day seven, right? This time God says, I want you to walk. Have the people walk around the city seven times. It's day seven. We're going to walk around the town, this town, seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you, the first six times, I want them to do what they've been doing the last six days. I want them to walk and march and anticipate in silence. The, the, the priests are to, to you know, blow their ram's horn. But on the seventh time, after the seventh time, they're to shout. They're to sing and they're to shout. That's what we're told. And so the seventh time around, as the people march, the priests sound their horns. Joshua says, shout for the Lord has given this day, this you, the city. And so the sh people shouted and the people sang and the priests blew their horns. And what happens? The Bible describes how God unleashes his power, doesn't he? The walls of Jericho come tumbling down. The people are defeated. And brothers and sisters, in this single display of obedience... God demonstrated to the Israelite nation that he was a king who they could trust. Now fast forward to Jesus. When Jesus' followers here in Luke chapter 19 began to shout and sing as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, what I propose that the people were declaring is their hope that Jesus would be a king and leader who would break down the walls in their life. Are you with me? You do know, don't you, that Jesus still has the power to break down walls? Personalize this. Where in your life do you want to experience God's power? What walls or barriers or addictions do you need Jesus to crumble? You know, there are people in my social world, and I suspect in yours too, who are facing a serious medical challenge. 
a medical challenge that they're being told is dire, life-threatening. Listen, I believe that God uses doctors and nurses to advance his kingdom agenda to help you and me to be healthy. That being said, even the best medical treatment cannot trump Jesus' power and authority. Why? Because Jesus is king. And when he is in conquering mode, there's no amount of doctor's negativity or forecast unfavorable medical forecast that can circumvent Jesus. Jesus is king, which is why we should and we can lean into him for his power when facing medical strongholds. You know, do any of you have a work obstacle that you're up against? Anybody here or tuning in online facing any kind of an employment Issue, maybe you need a break, breakthrough. Will you dare to believe that Jesus cares about your work stuff? Friends, Jesus is king. You know, for the last month or two, Joseph Goudinho has been playing his guitar up here on, on stage, and he as he did today. Joseph is in the uh, eighth grade uh, here in, goes to uh, Ensign, right, Joseph? Uh, middle school here in uh, Co Costa Mesa, Newport Beach area. And recently, Joseph expressed his desire to his parents, or expressed to his parents the desire that he wanted to go to Pacifica High School, which is a private Christian school in our area that has a s small tuition of $24,000 a year. Well, Beto and Millie don't have that kind of money to send their son to a high school. But as a family, do you know what they do have? They have Jesus. And they got a whole lot of faith. And so although finances pose a seemingly impossible barrier, when you got Jesus on your team, no money, no problem. So Joseph applied. He said, you know what, I'm going I'm to do my part, and I'm going to trust that Jesus, if he wants to, he can do his part. And so after several interviews and multiple community references and a whole lot of prayer, and, or a whole lot of, I guess, really prayer, combined with a whole lot of faith and hope and leaning on Jesus, Anybody want to venture a guess as to whether or not the school came back to Joseph and offered him a scholarship where he could go to school almost for tuition free? What do you think? Amen. Friends, amen. Friends, does Jesus care about our educational endeavors? Amen. You do it. No, he does. Would you say out loud on, on the count of three, Jesus is king. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Do you believe that or are those just words? Again, on the count of three, Jesus is king. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus is king. He is king. That's why we sing and we shout. That's why the people sing and shout. Jesus, we're told in Matthew, the gospel of Matthew writes how Jesus once preached this message in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, heavy burdened, he said, and I will give you rest. Translation, Jesus invites us to lean on him. Jesus invites us to worship him. Jesus invites us to cling to him for strength. That's why I believe that when Jesus' followers sang and shouted, they believed that Jesus is a king who can break down strongholds and seemingly insurmountable walls. And so, brothers and sisters, like the people in Jerusalem, who raised their voice as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on his donkey. Will you too, will I too, give Jesus my focus and praise? Why? We should. Why? Because he is king. He is the king of kings, and he has the authority to break down and crumble, what? Walls. So let's go to prayer. Time's about up here. Let's close our conversation with prayer.
put everything down, loosen your arms, you know, shake the tension out of your shoulders if there's anything there. David's going to come up and join me. Put your palms open again. Close your eyes just to block everything out. Not that there's anything spiritual in keeping your eyes closed or praying with your eyes closed, but just center down. And I want you to, just in your own mind, answer this question. What walls do you need Jesus to break down? What miracles do you want to lay before Jesus today? So with an open hand and an open heart and an open mind, pray this. Say, Jesus, I lay before you today and you fill in the blank. Jesus, I lay before you today Jesus, the people sang and shouted because they understood that you have power, supernatural power to do what no man or woman, boy or girl can do. So, Father, today I pray for those of us who are here and tuned in mind, who have in our life what feels like an insurmountable wall. That as we sit with you in this moment in silence, that we're sort of marching, God, we're marching around this obstacle. And with our hands open and our heart open, inside we're singing and praising, hoping that you're going to crumble this wall. It could be a medical issue. It could be a financial issue. It could be a relational issue. It could be a security issue. It could be a fear issue. It could be a love issue, forgiveness. You go through the list. Lord, we all have walls. And so in faith, we say thank you in advance for the hope that we have that you're at work, even if we can't see it. Jesus, that you're work at work behind the scenes, even when we're unaware. And we look forward to the day in faith when the walls will come, come tumbling down. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Would you say amen? Amen. Would you stand please and keep your palms open? I want to offer you one final blessing. Brothers and sisters, rest in the assurance that God is with you, he is for you, and he is going ahead of you. And he's going to work through you. Sometimes in what seems very insignificant ways. And so as you leave here today, and as you go about your day, be Jesus' hands and feet with your smiles and with your greetings and with your generosity as you do the little things well, knowing that God's going to use you not only to break down the walls in your own life, but to help break down the walls in other people's life. You are his hands and feet. So I bless you today with an overwhelming sense of his presence and his spiritual authority in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Sing and shout, amen and amen and amen.